I teach English to college and I help organize these readings. Um, we have uh, three more coming up if you're interested and you can register for each one of these on the same website that you used to register for this program. On March 18th at 1 p.m., uh, we're going to host a reading by award-winning poets Daisy Zamora and George Evans. On April 21st, we're going to host a reading with uh, well-known and award-winning poet Sharon Olds. And on May 4th, uh, we also publish a literary magazine here at the college. We're gonna do a virtual reading on that day um, as well. If any of you are interested in submitting work to the magazine to get published, um, you're welcome to do so, uh, whether you're affiliated with the college or not. If you write poems, short stories, take photography, uh, you can, on that same website that you use to register for this event, um, go ahead and, um, and check on the submission guidelines. Uh, the deadline for submissions is March 17th. So welcome to the reading. The format is pretty simple. Um, uh, once I introduce my colleague, Wayne Carlin, um, uh, you can click on the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of the screen and um, ask questions as the program is, is unfolding. Anything that, that comes to mind? And once uh, Adam Carlin has finished with his presentation, uh, we will have a Q&A. So just feel free to send questions in. They'll be monitored and, um, and then ask at the end of the, at the program, end of the program. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Wayne Carlin, for an intro of, of, of Adam. Thank you, Neil. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to introduce this particular writer, a personal pleasure in a deeper sense since he happens to be my son. It's also a pleasure in that he's appearing under the auspices of the College of Southern Maryland, which has been my home for over 30 years. And finally, it's a pleasure that while Adam will speak about the process and experience of being a travel writer, he has chosen to relate a story which is very deeply about our family and in particular, my wife's, his mother's side of the family. I know she'd be very proud. Adam once wrote another family piece that I can say touched me deeply. It was during his uh, senior year at the University of Washington. He'd signed up for a study abroad semester in Vietnam, but it was canceled because of another pandemic, um, the bird flu that was going on at, at, at that time. He decided to go anyway, and he talked to university into letting him do an independent study in Vietnam. And, and I'll come back to what he wrote shortly. The fact he decided to do that is, is one reason I have this gray hair. It's a gray cause not only by Adam's determination to spread his wings and go places around the world, but also by the kind of stuff he gets involved in when he does. I remember when he was, uh, I, I think about 10 or 11, his mother and I found a preemptive note he had left us telling us that our little rural county of St. Mary's was too restrictive for him and he was running away to New York. Don't worry, he wrote, and don't take it personally. Luckily, we found the note before he left and were able to talk him out of it. Locking him in, grounding him was never a possibility as he had Years before, perfected ways he could clandestinely unfasten the screens on his bedroom window and sneak out through the rose bush. We could never hold him down. Since then, among the many hair graying incidents that have happened since he started traveling, um, was getting close to being torn to pieces by a group of irritated baboons in Zimbabwe. Uh, charged by an elephant in Botswana, pulled off a train and interrogated by Tamil Tiger gorillas in Sri Lanka, robbed by a pack of street kids in Manila, nearly swallowed by a bog in the Hebrides Islands, and jailed by the police in Cameroon. That latter, I think, that latter incident, I think, tells something about his character, the sense of decency and honor that I so cherish about my son. He was picked up by the police because they were going to arrest his Cameroonian guide who'd become a friend, basically for refusing to bribe them. 
He believed if he, trading on his privilege as an American, insisted on being arrested with him, his friend would not be abused or held long. It was the kind of stubborn integrity he showed earlier when still a student on another study abroad semester in South Africa, refused to stay isolated within the safety of the program. Something, something I've seen uh, too many American students on study abroad programs do. Uh, they tend to create, sometimes create little American islands in which they, they can feel safe and secure as if they never, never left the States. Instead, he made friends in the poverty stricken township area of Cape Town ended up largely living and working there, coaching and mentoring kids through the uh, Amy Beale Foundation, which was, some, Amy Beale was, a, an Americ was a, a student who had been murdered in the townships and her parents had set up an NGO to provide aid and to foster reconciliation and racial healing. He showed his character also when he went to Vietnam and afterwards wrote the, sto wrote the story that I mentioned before um, it recounted how he climbed a mountain that had been in my area of operations when I was a Marine in the war there and lit incense and said a prayer for and thanked a friend of mine who had died near that mountain when he replaced me on a mission I was supposed to be on. I knew Adam knew the story of my friend, but I didn't know he would go up that mountain and express the gratitude of our family to Lance Corporal Jim Childers. It's the kind of thing he does. It gives me this gray hair and it fills me with gratitude and love for, for this speaker. I have one, one final note. Um, in the initial planning for this presentation, Anna was gonna spend most of the time speaking in general about some of his experiences as a travel writer and that process. He still will, but with the recent tragic events in Myanmar, he has chosen to share a story which touches on ways in which certain places in the world, such as Myanmar, in those places the, the historical and the political always in, intrude inextricably onto the personal. So it's my pleasure to welcome Adam. Thanks, Ed. Um, <clears throat> he's too kind. Um, I've definitely been guilty of living in my islands when studying abroad. Um, but thanks, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, this piece uh, was published in Catapult in 2018, and it was published at a time when Myanmar, where my mom is from, um, was opening up and reforming and becoming a democratic nation that, a democratic republic that many people in that country and many people in the Burmese diaspora had long wished for. And just to be clear, the country has been named both Burma and Myanmar. I largely use Myanmar in this piece, but um, I won't go into the historical nitty gritty of why both names are used, um, but they are. Um, in any case, Myanmar was, or Burma was uh, under a military dictatorship from 1962 until 2015 when uh, uh, reforms allowed uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, the democracy leader, to become um, the elected leader of the country. That experiment ended um, about two weeks ago with a military coup and the situation is still dicey on the ground there and I have family there who, um, Sometimes I can talk to them and sometimes I can't, and it's very frustrating. But this piece was written at a time when I could both talk with and visit my family there. And I am comparing a very different reform, uh, democratic reform Myanmar to the totalitarian Burma I initially experienced. Um, so with that in mind, it's the piece about that country, which I love very deeply and family and travel and home, when the moon met the tiger. When we landed in Rangoon, the whole family was there, the uncles and aunts, their faces and smiles reflecting the faded light of Ming Mingaladon Airport, old chartreuse light, pregnant with the dusty updraft of the pothole tarmac, lights first installed in the 1970s, updated and fixed in now. Never updated, rarely fixed. This was Burma, 1997, where everything you touched was a relic, a leftover, jury rigged to survive like Frankenstein's monster or moldering in rusted obscurity. The luminescence of the airport lights had corroded to the yellow of dry parchment after years of sweating and tropical heat. 
I was 17 away from America for the first time. Like many youngsters on the road, I had hopes of adventure and exploration, dreams realized in the smiles of Burmese relatives, the aggressive pitch of taxi drivers outside of the airport gates, the streams of blood red Beetlejuice spit that dribbled over the cracked footpaths, the hungry eyes of pie dog packs. Beyond the airport security gate, my great aunt, Tin Tin Thane, tall, graceful, long black hair pouring an ink waterfall across her back. I remembered that hair or dreamed a trace of a memory of sifting dark jasmine scented strands through my fingers as a toddler when she stayed with my mother and helped raise me during my first year on earth. Tin Tin, built like a willow with a spine of iron. She berated the security guards and custom officials until they smiled and threw their hands up. The olive drab agents of one of the world's most brutal totalitarian regimes cowed into embarrassed acquiescence by the sustained chiding of an energetic granny. Aunt Tinny, pushing through the guards, held my smooth teenaged hands in hers. Let's go home, she whispered. Those aren't the words that typically begin a travel saga. My parents were behind me, and having your folks in tow isn't how great adventures usually begin. But when you're young and abroad for the first time, the horizon seems endless, even if you're seeing it with your relatives. A family friend picked us up, and we drove through Rangoon. Old, old Rangoon, a Southeast Asian Havana. Ancient cars slain by decades of driving on unmaintained roads, revived by local mechanics working a sort of automotive necromancy on rusted shells that had turned from powder blue to oxide red in the typhoon-prone rice bowl that encircled the then Burmese capital. Rangoon was no thriving Asian sweatbox. Later in my life, I would visit or work in Jakarta, Manila, Kuala Lumpur, and Ho Chi Minh City. In those cities, humanity and concrete and neon press against each other like tin sardines, creating a Malthusian vice that squeezes out a constant broth of traffic horns, durian rinds, and the acidic tang of petrol. There was none of that in Rangoon, 1997. Burma, which had officially just become Myanmar, no one called it by the new name yet, was too isolated from the world to experience the growth that precedes megapolization. Here the night smelled of fruit, and sizzling fry oil. There were stretches of Rangoon that were darker than the indigo night sky, black groves of coconut trees, copses of panadu. The orange reflection of candles and oil lamps shakily flickered off the gold leaf of Buddhist stupas. Inverted bells that stood in areas once worshipped for their animistic energy, their powers of fertility, wealth, and luck, now dedicated to a humanistic philosophy that preached worldly renunciation. Candlelight and paraffin fire. Sodium bulbs barely illuminating the cracked streets. I won't pretend there was no neon, but there were fitful bursts of electricity, likely to be snuffed by frequent power outages. The car drove on under starlight, which was visible even in a city of six million. We turned onto a street of large houses huddled behind high walls. We stopped at a gate and tooted the horn. The wrought iron protested years of rust and then stood aside. An old man was waiting on the front step of a two-story house a residence that was modest by American standards and enormous by Burmese. My dad inclined his head. Hello, sir, he said. It was the first time I heard my dad call anyone sir. Hi, Grandpa, I said. My tone was respectful as well, if weighed with the affection of a grandson who used to play sumo wrestler with his ample-bellied grandfather. Still, I knew he was held in high public reverence. Born into British colonial Burma, my grandfather, Rapopo, became a leader of the colonial independence movement. For much of the 1930s and 40s, he battled the British, then the Japanese, and then following Burmese statehood, a long list of opium warlords, Kuomintang militias, communist insurgents, and hinterland bandits. At one point, he was captured and held as a POW in a jungle camp. He made two escapes, succeeding in the latter attempt with the aid of Burmese commandos after piloting a jeep over the slumped corpse of its driver. Following a military coup that ended Burmese parliamentary democracy in 1962, Popo, then a general, was seen as a threat to the dictatorship's power base, but still considered a hero of the revolution. So he was sent to exile as a diplomat, where he served his country as a military attache to Thailand and the UK, an ambassador to Yugoslavia and Israel. He brought his three children with him to all of these places, and in Israel, his youngest daughter met an American studying abroad, my dad. While the international interracial relationship was not without its bumps, my grandfather would later tell me that, upon becoming a diplomat, he had expected at least one of his children to marry a foreigner. And besides, he saw a kindred soldier spirit in my father who had spent a tour of duty in Vietnam. In later years, Popo retired from public life and became a staunch supporter of the Burmese democracy movement. 
a deeply religious Buddhist, a grandfather who would stick his belly out to play sumo wrestler with me. He was older now. I kissed his head in greeting. Inside, rice, fermented fish, dried flaky shrimp, chilies pounded and mixed with oil, salty fried shallots. Two old uncles, not blood relatives, but former officers under my grandfather's command called on us for dinner. Buddhist monks arrived wearing dark saffron robes. They had come to bless the household on the eve of the homecoming of my Burmese mother and her American husband and their half Burmese son. I was a senior in high school, suspicious of anything that smacked of religion, but even I was taken with the soft, whispered spirituality the monks seemed to embody. We toasted to democracy in Burma, but kept our voices down. Who knew if the secret police were prowling too close to a window? Who knew what the government, which was then keeping Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi under house arrest, and is doing that now, aside, would do to a family that openly supported democracy, even if the scions of said family were war heroes? The night wore on, and Aunt Tinny led me upstairs to my bedroom. She hugged me, and her river of hair smelled like jasmine. I turned the lights off, but the room was aglow. Silver moonlight chased candle shadows across the chocolate teak wood floor. Outside the steel lattice of the window, the wind blew wet and hot, and jungle crows sang to each other in dinosaur rasps. The night drew in. I saw the moon wink behind the palm fronds. When we landed in Yangon, my uncle was drunk. The lights of the new airport terminal were reflected in a fluorescent backwash off of his head, shaved to the skin in prayer, and I assumed preparation for mourning. When a close family member dies, Many Burmese will spend at least a few days in a Buddhist monastery. He hugged my wife and me briefly and looked at our infant daughter, his great, his, his great niece, for the first time. Hello, dear, he said. The driver arrived in a new car. Chinese, climate controlled to frosty chill with an air freshener and moist towelettes in the seat pockets. We drove into traffic. There was traffic everywhere. Other new climate controlled Chinese parts Chinese cars packed the streets, exhaust to bumper, filled with attractive young people, well-dressed and chic. Have they been hiding the last time I was here or receiving posh private educations in Australia, Singapore, Britain? They drove to new whiskey bars, new Italian restaurants, new studio galleries, new clothing boutiques. There were barely any new traffic lights though. All the news spoke to personal consumption, not public infrastructure. The only new public projects I saw were enormous temples and stupas built with the wealth and lucre of an emergent upper class and a comparative religion class I had once read about the prominence of duality in East Asian religion. This was perhaps its ultimate expression, gold dusted monuments to renunciation springing up alongside a thousand temples of conspicuous consumption. I first came to Rangoon, Burma in 1997. This was Yangon, Myanmar. Everyone used the new name now in 2015. In the 18 years that had passed, the country had clamped down on the democratic opposition, relaxed, clamped down again. In 2007, thousands of Buddhist monks had taken to the streets to protest the totalitarian regime. Many had been beaten or shot for their efforts. In 2010, for reasons academics still argue about, Aung San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest. In 2012, she and her National League for Democracy swept into power in the parliament. There had been no bloody revolution. The army stepped aside, not completely, but enough to allow for some kind of democratic reform and a steaming load of crony capitalism. And it should be noted, only stepped aside a little bit and has now stepped back into power. At the time though, two parties came to fill the vacuum of military oppression. From the West, an alphabet soup of NGOs and development agencies. From China, a small army of contractors and construction firms bringing wads of cash. Not many Burmese had benefited from the newcomer's presence, but some had. They worked as translators and fixers and consultants, bought cars, built shops, and got in traffic jams as they drove their cars to the shops. In the 18 years that had passed, I'd seen all this change and fold on frequent visits. Along the way, I had met and married my wife and had a kid, and my relatives had gotten older. Great uncles had passed. Great aunts had become invalid. And then, in October of 2015, my grandfather took ill. His organs were failing. He was soon bedridden and uncommunicative. Our daughter Sanda, Burmese for moon, had never met her one surviving great-grandparent. Now was likely to be her last chance. The car, the car drove on under neon lights, which blotted out the stars and cast a red glow on children rooting through trash, girls in hot pants, and dogs with hungry eyes. We turned onto a street of gigantic houses, 
huddled behind high walls and newly built fences crowned with razor wire and spikes. We stopped at a gate, tooted the horn. The wrought iron screamed at decades of rust and then stood aside. There was no one to greet us at the two-story house, a residence that was modest by the standards of the gaudy mansions that had sprouted up around it. Most of the family was at the hospital with Popo. My uncle poured himself a drink. We settled into the guest room where the mildew had spread like a fungal web from the window AC units. We waited to see if Aunt Tinny would come home to meet Sonda for the first time. An iPhone rang. My uncle called us downstairs. Let's go see Popo. As we drove to the hospital, we got caught in another traffic jam. I took out a copy of the in-flight magazine I had saved from the plane and read an article about a Harvard alum who came to Yangon to partner with one of the country's native oligarchs. Their grand business plan was to bring food trucks to Yangon. There was even talk of that most hipster of rodeos, a food truck roundup, which would gather near an ancient waterfront warehouse that was being converted into a studio space for contemporary art. The aim of all of the above, according to the magazine, was to, quote, introduce art and culture and cuisine into Burma. Outside the car in its frigid air, in the heat haze of the outside world, I saw a mother suckle nurse a baby near a roadside noodle stand. A man squatted next to her, selling fried bananas, crisping, and peanut oil. Next to both of them was a wall overlaid with sketches of monks, hawkers, street life, village life. Next to that, a man hiked up his sarong and pissed on a pile of rubbish. It seemed odd, I thought, that the aristocrat and his Harvard friend wanted to bring something to Myanmar, street culture, that the country already possessed in spades. Art and food were already plentiful on the streets. It was the toilets and the trash pickup that needed work. I felt an anger growing. I wanted my old Burma, not this new Myanmar. The old Burma was palm trees and moonlight, and bougainvillea petals and black hair, Buddhist monks who promised spirituality and political reform as opposed to golden pagodas built to the god of ego, bicycle bells instead of traffic jams. But then I immediately felt embarrassed and ashamed. The old Burma was also summary executions and no free press, poverty and starvation, secret police and the promise of torture for an overheard complaint in a tea house. I might note that it's unfortunately going back to that. At the time, though, the new Myanmar wasn't perfect. Even in 2015, the groundwork was being laid for the present-day displacement and genocide of the Rohingya people, and there were uh, clauses within the Constitution that would allow the military to retake control the way they've done. But to want an old Orientalist fantasy back, no matter how beautiful the real edges of that fantasy often were, was the height of selfishness. I was indulging the traveler's conceit, wanting a country or a place to bend to my desires rather than bending myself to fit its reality. We pulled up to the hospital. Inside, beeps, whirring lights, doctors and nurses rushing to their stations and wards. New machines glinted under the lights, which glowed with the consistent power of reliable electricity. And the old Burma, I thought, my grandfather would likely already be dead. We entered his room. The whole family was there. The uncles, the aunts, their eyes reflecting the worry of sleepless nights. Tintin, -tin, now in her 80s, had almost collapsed in grief. Her river of black hair now wisped with serious clouds of gray and white. In his youth, my grandfather was a tiger. Tall, broad-shouldered, full-faced. He had led soldiers into the mountains of the Golden Triangle to set ambushes for drug runners and bandits. Later in life, he wore bespoke tailored suits, drank scotch in one hand and smoked a cigarette in the other, while talking military tactics with Moshe Diane, negotiating treaties with Joseph Bronze Tito. He could not smile now, there was a feeding tube in his throat. He could not run at me screaming sumo because his groin was attached to a catheter. His hair was white and thin. His hands, which had held machetes and assault rifles and scotch, were liver spotted and paralyzed. But his eyes, clouded and mist with cataracts and pain, turned to me and Sonda. She held out her arm, her fingers, and clutched his nose in her tiny quarter Burmese hands. He kept his eyes on his great-granddaughter. She kept her hand on her great-grandfather. The room was still. They held that moment for a few seconds, or maybe years. It was hard to say. I know that eventually we left, and I sobbed into my arm, knowing that in truth the old Burma I wanted had nothing to do with jasmine and moonlight. It was the place where my family was alive. For all the romance I once wanted from travel, escape, adventure, possibilities, when all was said and done, I made that journey so that there could be a homecoming. A homecoming could happen across many continents. It's not a physical place, but a family's embrace, or an infant's fingers digging into her great-grandfather's flesh. Wu Thane Dok, a father of modern Burma, now Myanmar, 
my grandfather, died the next day. He had seen his country free itself from the shackles of British colonialism and Japanese imperialism. He had seen it torn apart by civil war, then repressed by military rule. He had seen it stagnate through decades of misrule, seen it fight for its democratic voice. He had seen all of these things because he had fought for them, and when he was close to death's door, he fought for one more thing, a glimpse of his great-granddaughter. I'd been wrong. The old Burma and the new Myanmar shared the same moonlight. And that's that. Thank you. Beautiful piece. So, yeah. well, I, I want to take off on that and, and uh, ask a couple of questions, and then we'll we'll be getting into the, uh, the question and answer part and bring in more of your experiences through that. I, I, I think you articulated something very beautifully in in, in that piece. You know, which gets to me. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that sense of being both an outsider uh, and an insider. Your your mom was Burmese. We have family there. Um, and when you're an outsider, you're an American visiting a foreign country. So how is it like coming home? How is it like not coming home? Um, um, I home, think I think, means a, a sense of security and comfort. Yeah. Um, so what, you know, what reinforced that for you and what reinforced your sense of being a, being an outsider? I mean, I think what reinforces the sense of home in a place like Burma uh, is the family that's there. And that's what creates a sense of home where I go anywhere where I feel like I have a circle of people. Um, my family is obviously a very tight circle, but I will say, you know, there's places where I've worked um, overseas where I now have kind of a network of people. Um, I've just, you know, friends I've made on repeated visited, visits. And whenever I go to those places, um, there is a sense of community and home just by dint of personal connection. And I don't know that it goes, it's much more complicated than that. Anywhere where you go, where you have um, a network of people, uh, you know, forged by deep personal connections, you're going to, when you see them again, um, you feel like, like barely any time has passed. I feel like the pandemic is also kind of underlines that lesson because now we all, or many of us have had to go through a year um, of not seeing a lot of people we know, um, but we're kind of longing to do it. But really like that, because of the weird nature of my job, I go through long stretches of distance from these people who I've made connections with. And now we've all kind of gone through a long period of distance from people we've made connections with. But I don't think that that really weakens those connections. Um, as for what makes me feel like an outsider in a place like Burma, I mean, if we didn't have family there and if I didn't have uh, con personal connections there, I think I would feel very odd in some ways because I don't speak the language. Um, I was raised in a Burmese American household. So I know what it feels like. I. I recognize a lot of the forms. I can recognize menu items. I can recognize the language sounds familiar. Uh, the smells are familiar in a way that, you know, wouldn't be the case if I was in a place that I just have no connection to. But honestly, in a way that would almost underline how alienated I would feel because while I could recognize the food and maybe some of the music, the fact that I wouldn't be able to speak the language um, would be, would feel like a big barrier. Um, the other thing, though, that does, I think, can make a place, uh, make a place feel familiar is at least having a cursory understanding. And I hate saying this, but I mean, sometimes even, you know, if you only have time, just go through the Wikipedia article, but like having a cursory understanding of the history and current affairs of that country, like taking the half hour to do that, to read up on that, just makes you feel a lot more grounded in the place. Um, it may not make it feel like home, but it will make it feel less alien. It's uh, when you're, would part of that, that sense of, of not being at home also, and I, I think this speaks to traveling in general, um, in, a, in a place that's going through a, a upheaval, like Myanmar or, or other places, um, you, you have the knowledge also that you can leave. Right. Right. That, that um, 
this is something you can observe and, and be, more, be more or less. I mean, you can get in danger, obviously, but but you're not investing in the same way that somebody living there would have. You can you can leave it. Mm -hmm. that, that increase that sense you're you know you're going to be outside that bubble, outside that culture. Yeah, I think that that's um, for sure. The, there's Especially in a, yeah, as you say, like, especially in a country where the people in that country would do anything to get out of that place. The fact that you can do that, that you have that power um, and privilege is just something that does set you apart. Um, and it's something I think that you always have to be aware of, you know, I, like I'm hesitant to make this comparison because the power and income differential, differential maybe it's not that this this wide but at a certain point like it all becomes relative but you know if jeff bezos was just hanging out with you pretending to be one of the one of the guys there's an understanding there that that's like a little bit disingenuous and i think like if you try a kind of too much familiarity with people who are living through that kind of upheaval or conditions um you know that that over familiarity can i think actually be a little uh insulting yeah, I understand it. So, I mean, kind of taking off on that, um, and speaking of being an American traveling abroad, some, sometimes uh, we don't have the best reputations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, judging a place through our own filters of what um, what should be there or, or, or shouldn't be there. I mean, Neil mentioned to me once about students complaining about the size of ice cubes mm -hmm. in the, in Ireland, you know, right. of all places. Um, so, it, you know, it, this is not what I'm used to, and therefore it shouldn't be like this. There's a kind of judgment. Uh, have you noticed some of that? And and if so, how would you advise Americans to behave in the sense of being, you know, accepted by folks in the place they're visiting? And um, and what you know, what's the most valuable gain to take from that? Sorry, there's about three or four questions wrapped in there, but let, let you know. Let's start with. Um, have, have you noticed that among Americans or other people traveling abroad that tendency to judge by your own standards? Um, yeah. It's a complicated question with a few answers. And one of those answers is hard to really put my finger on because I think there's gonna be such a shift in how Americans are perceived abroad in a post uh, after in a post COVID world, if we, no matter how long it takes us to get there, um, I did travel to South Korea last spring to take a Burmese relative to Seoul Airport so she could fly home, and even just a day there. So I did a lot of my travel in a kind of in the 2000s uh, during the War on Terror, and um, I think Americans didn't have a great reputation there, but there was also a sense like when you were abroad, there were a lot of people around the world who kind of, they kind of said, well, you know, we know, we understand Americans aren't necessarily, that necessarily they're politicians and they wanted to talk to America. They, they were curious uh, to talk to Americans. Now I get the sense in a post COVID world, there is, and I think part of that curiosity came from America being the kind of undisputed most powerful country in the world at the time. While that is true now, I think that there is a bit of a, I mean, honestly, in a place like South Korea, where pro-American sentiment, or like, you know, the present, the American military presence has, uh, is, is almost taken for granted. Um, and it's controversial, but uh, in, in any case, I, I'd never seen in South Korean English language media, seen the US criticized so much and that was for the COVID response. I mean, basically people, especially in East Asia, where there is a, uh, where wearing a mask is not a cultural um, kind of issue. People were just shocked and kind of aghast by what they saw as our unwillingness to engage in kind of basic, um, take basic precautions uh, for pre preventing the pandemic spread. And I'm sorry, not to like harp on that one issue for so much, but it really is, I think it really has changed how the world sees America. Like. And I think that 
during the war on terror, people might have criticized America, but they still did so from the perspective of America as a superpower. It might be a superpower doing something we don't like, but it's a superpower. Now there's almost a, geez, what are the Americans doing? Um, th at least that's what it feels like based off things that I'm reading overseas. But, you know, like everybody else, I haven't been traveling that much uh, since the pandemic started. Um, but I think in terms of being an American abroad, like what you can do, I, it, it comes down to anyone. And honestly, in defense of Americans abroad, I've seen plenty of tur tourists from all over the world uh, act like assholes. Um, it is not something that is particular to Americans. And in fact, I actually think that I, I generally have been pretty impressed with the Americans I've seen abroad outside of places like uh, where you get mass influxes of American tourism, like say Negril, Jamaica, or um, I'm trying to think of other places. Um, anyway, areas like that where you get a ton of Americans who are coming on kind of package holiday tours, like yes, there is a, people might act, uh, act badly. But I think like being curious, engaged and open is, is a way of being a good traveler. And that applies to Americans as, uh, as much as anyone else. The other thing that influences the way travelers are are seen by people in other countries um, has been just the rise of social media and influencer culture and the way travel influencer culture has become such a thing. But again, Americans are hardly the only ones, uh, you know, engaging in those practices. And in fact, like you see people in parts of the world that you may not expect um, because in a lot of the world, people have phones and internet access. Like you see people in areas that you might consider undeveloped or poor or third world who are actually building up their own social media kind of influencer presence. Um, and in a way that actually creates a parity between American or Western travelers and people in those places. I, I guess uh, um, you had mentioned before the idea of uh, the difference, if there is a difference between being a being a tourist and being a traveler. And, you know, one of the things we're doing with this, hopefully doing with this uh, program uh, is encouraging people once they get the opportunity again, you know, once we, we get out of the uh, pandemic to, to travel, to go abroad. So, you know, two parts to that. I mean, what, what how would you define the difference between being a tourist and being a traveler? Um, and then I want to go into what you feel you've, you know, this, this is, this has been your life. As I said, for, you know, from the introduction. So, you know, what, what is it of, of, of real value that, that you've taken from the kind of life you've lived? Um, so the tourist versus traveler difference, I think sometimes comes down to uh, a bit of pretentious labeling. Like I, I think that that question gets framed in a way that presumes that being a traveler is better. Um, and I get a little, I, uh, I tend to back away from that distinction because I think like everybody can be a tourist. I think you can be a well engaged tourist. I think, I think there's a lot of the association with those two terms is that the traveler is independent, curious and engaged. And the tourist is kind of just schlepping around, uh, in a, you know, taking selfies, a, right. Taking selfies or, or, or on a package tour. But I think <clears throat> Being a tourist uh, to me just means that you're going somewhere to see sites and there's nothing wrong with going and seeing the prominent places that are not the, uh, the secret underground, um, less yelped about spots. Okay. Like if you go to India, you should go to the Taj Mahal. Um, if you go to Washington, you should go see the Lincoln Memorial. These things are iconic and they are integral to that place. I think what makes somebody a more engaged traveler or tourist or what have you is asking questions about what makes this, this destination, um, what gives it meaning? Why is the Lincoln Memorial important? Why is it given such pride of place on the national mall? Why, um, what's left out there? What do these words mean to people? How has it been interpreted by the people in this country? I think that's a much more, a better measure of being uh, engagement and curiosity than um, than seeing certain things or not seeing other things. Um, so yeah, 
I don't know if I like to make the distinction between tourist and traveler, but I think I like to make the distinction between engaged and kind of incurious. And I think you should, if you're going somewhere, it's a privilege, all right? And it is a privilege. Like you will go to some countries where people do not have the opportunity to leave their countries, or if they have that opportunity, it's much more difficult for them to do it than it is for you to go there. So live up to that privilege and be curious about the place you're in and ask questions about it and eat the local, eat the food and I don't know, be grateful that you get to do something that m millions, if not billions of people don't get to do. Um, I'm not saying don't have fun either, by the way. Like I think being engaged can absolutely mean having a lot of fun. Like eating local food can be a hoot um, and you should go out to a bar if such is your desire and have some drinks with locals too. I mean, these are all ways of engaging and being curious about a place. Um, it doesn't have to be this like dour academic exercise. Like it shouldn't be. Um, you're traveling there. Like you should be living life to its fullest. And I guess I'll segue that into what I've learned from living this life, which is, um, I, it, it sounds asinine or cliche, but I mean, there is a, an element of carpe diem there that the world is a gift and you should explore it. Uh, and engage with it as much as you can, because I mean, why not? Like it's out there. Um, it seems silly to turn your back on it. Um, approach it with an open mind and learn what you can from it. I mean, don't be such an open mind that um, that you're a sieve, you know? Like you need to, um, I, I say that because I think sometimes people will travel to a place and, you know, I. Like it's worth noting, like I have traveled to countries where I have felt that people have been very warm and friendly and engaging. And in that cult, like in that particular culture, people may be deeply homophobic and say extremely offensive things about, you know, gay and lesbian people. Um, and to be fair, that culture can exist uh, outside of the US and it can certainly exist inside the US. But I've never, you know, there's, there is a, there is a line on being open-minded and I've never heard that kind of sentiment and, uh, and kind of nodded along in agreement. I mean, yeah. I, in situations where it's socially awkward, um, I'll probably just stay quiet. Although I have argued that situation where I, uh, when I feel like it's warranted. Um, but yeah, go uh, to, to experience the world is like a huge gift. And it's a gift that I think most people in the West have and often don't take advantage of. And it's kind of baffling to me why you wouldn't do that. Um, you know, I mean, the meals in front of you eat. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to um, turn this over. To, uh, we, I see we're having questions coming in. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Neil, who's been taking, taking the questions and um, you know, let's, let's continue the, the conversation, the dialogue. Okay. Neil, would you like to come on? I would love to come on. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I was I might, I might, I might blink off at some at some point, but I'll stay on right okay. now. Okay. Well we'll 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 work for another we'll entertain questions for another 15 minutes. Um but I've been jotting down, you know, that last thing you said about um there's a there's a meal right in front of you. Go you know, partake. I mean it's a it's an inspirational it's insightful and your answers to the questions are nuanced. So thank you, thank you. It's, it's easy for us to you know, paint broad strokes um, when it comes to visiting a, a, another culture um, in a place that we may not feel too comfortable in, familiar with. And so thank you. Um, you could have, um, you could have done a lot with your dad's question about travel, traveler versus uh, tourist, and I think you answered it really, really well. Thank you. No Thank you for that. Um, so, among other, <clears throat> we have comments. Um, beautiful work, Adam. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing. Um, I got. I have one here though that I thought you might entertain, and um, being being half Burmese. Um, are there any aspects of American life that feel alien to you? Um, I guess you can also take that into the, um, in, the, in the context of having 
you know, traveled so widely, but yeah, yeah uh, Bur Burmese uh, mom and, and American dad. Um, anyway, go ahead and, 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 and answer Delaney's question. Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, look, I was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Southern Maryland. I mean, I went to Great Mills High School. I think, I mean, a lot of my life was a pretty American-ass American life, you know, like I was a very country teenager in St. Mary's County. Um, and yeah, I had a dog, the whole shebang. I think, honestly, if I'm being honest, I think that there were probably elements of Burmese culture that I found alien and weird as a, you know, growing up and trying to fit in that I probably consciously distanced myself from uh, when I was a teenager because, you know, you're trying to fit in. Um, what I will say, though, is, so, I, no, I don't think being half Burmese has made me feel like elements of American culture feel foreign because I think partly because, and I don't think this is just a Burmese thing. I honestly think this is for immigrants from really any nation or children of immigrants from any nation immigrants come here like wanting to integrate and i just don't know any second generation kid who didn't feel that intense pressure to integrate from their parents um you know i live uh in louisiana now and i have um the uh, we've been renovating my house a lot of the people doing renovation in new orleans are honduran and so one of our contractors like is a honduran guy but, you know, his kid, um, like, they they speak to him in English, and, like, the, the, the son, I think he's 11 years old, um, they were coming over here, and his son was hanging out with my daughter, like, and they're very American, so I don't know that the alienness, like, if, if, if I feel like an outsider in America because of my immigrant background, I feel like an outsider in America when I've been abroad for a long time, and I come back, um, then I am kind of grappling with Honestly, just, um, you know, a lot of things like I look, I will cop to the fact that I like to get Taco Bell when I get back in the States because like I know it's terrible, but like it's like that's my fast food vice and I will own that. But also, you know, just watching the amount of waste that we 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 leave out or um, the size of our cars and the size of our roads and um I don't think like uh, shop well not malls so much anymore because malls are all closing. But you know things like that are really hard to get your head around. I I hate say I, I don't want to be I don't know I get worried about saying this because I I don't want to like come off here as somebody who's like really hard on kids or anything. But I one of the things that's been striking me lately, and maybe this is because my kids are six and two now, is like American parents seem really indulgent coming back from being abroad and. I, you know, I don't want to go in one direction, which is where I've seen like a kid sprain their knee. Uh, this was in Mongolia, but I think the family was Russian Mongolian and the kid was just crying there and the parents just ignored the kid for like 10 minutes. That feels a little too harsh, but there are elements of, I don't know, just the kind of bending over backwards and stopping adult conversation to like indulge kids all the time. Um, that kind of blows my mind uh, whenever I'm abroad and I, and I come home. Um, the, the size of the vehicle thing too, that same Mongolia trip, um, Mongolia has uh, pretty poor infrastructure in a lot of the more rural parts of the country. And you, we, I, I had rented uh, a Russian Jeep for one portion of that trip and a Land Rover for another portion. And we were like going over serious mountains and ravines and, by f and we would get there and there would be a family of Mongolians driving the most common car in Mongolia, which is a Prius. Um, the government gives tax breaks to Mongolians who buy Priuses and they would, you know, I think in the States, the Prius is not seen as a masculine off-roady car, but they were taking their Prii, I guess, like over mountain passes. And um, whereas... Then I came back to Louisiana and I saw a guy with a Ford F-250 who refused to like haul some um, some kind of timber uh, clearance that we, you know, out of a, out of city park when we did a park cleanup there because he didn't want to damage the undercarriage. So, you know, there you go. It's very specific. <laughs> this is, um, thanks for the, for the response. Adam. This is actually um, related to what you were just talking about. 
Um, but uh, Andrea asks, uh, states, I remember that you said that you brought your daughter on a work trip for a lonely planet. How has being a father impacted the lens with which you see these places? Um, hi, Andrea. Um, uh, it's a lot more fun. I mean, it's a lot more stressful in a lot of ways. Like having your kid with you just involves having your kid with you. But there is, I think that the best kind of traveling is kind of looking at the world with those open, soft kid eyes and just not hardening yourself to the wonder of the world and the kind of magic that's there. And when I had my daughter with me, you know, she feels like that when we go down to the corner. So she's obviously feeling it more when we were, in this case, we were in Atlantic Canada. Um, it's wonderful. It was really great to see that kind of wonder. But look, I will admit, she is a good traveler. Um, I could strap her into the car and uh, put a pad in front of her and we could drive for hours and hours and she wasn't complaining. Um, you know, there are definitely, I love traveling with my kids. I think it can be a wonderful adventure, but you do have to, you know, kids are only so flexible. Um, so you have to be aware of that too. But I do think that looking at the world with kind of open questioning, curious eyes is the best way to look at the world. And kids have a lot to teach us in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Um, seeing the world through a child's eyes, it's always good to be reminded. Here's one that came in, and maybe we can wrap things up with this, a good story. I, 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 I wondered this myself, but um, what was the most harrowing or dramatic time you had? Uh, that's a tough one. Hmm. I mean, ah, uh, geez. I'm trying to come up here with like a not cliched, uh, you know, dad gave a lot of uh, moments of danger of getting robbed in the Philippines and getting arrested and, and all that. And I, all that sucks, you know. Um, but I got to say, all that sucks, but you can kind of look back on it and laugh because it's a moment that's uh, dangerous or scary in the moment. I think the moments that have really gotten to me, one is like feeling just alienated and isolated while you're on the road. Um, that can be alleviated by having open eyes and, and being curious. But I think the moments that have gotten to me, the most harrowing moments are when you're able to look at a culture, a new place, and you can look at it and kind of fall in love with it. And then you see ugly sides of it. Um, and like people are people and people can be beautiful all over the world and people can be ugly all over the world. And, you know, I, I can think of a lot of specific instances, but being in a bar in the Philippines and um, just a guy coming up to me and asking me if I was Muslim um, and then getting really pissed off. And I said I wasn't. Um, and he got really pissed off at me and just seeing like, you know, some really ugly anti-Muslim sentiment in the Philippines, the flip side being in Malaysia and hearing some people saying awful anti-Semitic things, um, hearing Muslims say awful anti-Semitic things, you know, and that's one of those things where literally these are two countries that are very close to each other. And those trips were just a few months apart for me. And you could hear somebody being a bigot towards one group in one place and then hear those same people, people from that same religion being a bigot towards another group in another place. It sucks. Um, that kind of understanding that as wide as the world is and uh, as many beautiful connections there are to be made, there will always be people who willingly decide to cut off those connections so that they can ensconce themselves in a kind of armor of prejudice. And, uh, and that sucks, but it is part of the world and you hope to chip away from it by, by being curious and engaged and, uh, and sometimes by taking a stand and arguing back with people, which has happened too. Thank you. One last one, we can squeeze one more in here. And it is, um, I know it's a, it's a difficult question, um, but I guess if you could 
maybe maybe you do, maybe you don't, but if you could rate maybe the top one or two places um, in your experience, uh, what would they be? That's a tough one, yeah. It's unfair. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll tell you why it's unfair is because I think it depends on what you want at the time. I think like, so that trip I took with my daughter, that was to Newfoundland in Canada and we loved it. We had such a good time. But Newfoundland in Canada is a place like that was great to take uh, a four-year-old American girl because uh, English is the language. You know, it's a different place, but at the end of the day, we could still get pizza at night and have a warm hotel room and watch movies when we needed to. I mean, that might not be what somebody is looking for if they want a more uh, quote-unquote adventurous trip. Um, I get that, you know. Um, I live in New Orleans because I came here for Lonely Planet to write a guidebook. And at the time I was 29 and I loved New Orleans. I mean, I still love New Orleans, but I love New Orleans for a lot of different reasons when I was 29 and single than I do as a 40 year old parent, right? Like it's, um, you know, it, things change. Um, so anyway, I think that uh, I don't want to give to, uh, long and uh, fuzzy of an answer here. I will say that in terms of sheer cultural diversity, fe and like feeling like you are someplace where you could learn a lot and things are going to be different from your perspective as an American, I would say India, um, which is, it's almost unfair to call India a country, right? Like it really, you know, it's the subcontinent. It really is a subcontinent. It is a place, the, old, the oldest contiguous civilization in the world, um, you know, as many languages spoken, if not more than in Europe. Um, and it's just such a dazzling, complicated place. Um, I think that like, if you're looking to go to a place that's going to challenge you, that you can still fall in love with. Like I would highly, I would put India high on that list. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about as, about as best as I can do as saying like, what's the best? Um, you know, I have some places I don't like, but I don't want to get into that either because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Adam, um, thank you again. Um, My pleasure. I, I, I think that, you know, you're, your breadth of experience and, and, and travels and your passion for it um, is, is contagious. And let's just pray that we'll be able to put this pandemic behind us and start getting back on planes. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. I'm all for that. Thank you again, Adam. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. With that, we'll end. And I hope to see all of you back in March. 